Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, my name is Luigi Cruz, and I am going to present about my, the software we developed at the Allen Telescope Array to process the data produced by the telescope in real time. Um, first, um, this is uh, what I'm planning to talk today. First of all, our ET mascot here, all the logs from the observatory will start with, with this guy here. Um, so first, I will give a short introduction um, to the history of the Allen Telescope Array and its capabilities and hardware. Then I will give an introduction to interferometry and beamforming, but just uh, enough for you to understand what we'll talk about here. And later, I will introduce Blade and its architecture uh, and give an in-depth overview about each component. Uh, and finally, some production example uh, we'll be giving with some extra performance tips. Um, so this is the Allen Telescope Array. It is located uh, in Northern California, uh, around uh, one hour uh, northeast of, of Reading. It was built originally from 2002 to 2007 uh, with two purposes in mind. The first one is to, do, con to uh, conduct astronomical um, observations like every other radio telescope in the world, and also uh, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, uh, looking for narrow band signals transmitted by other entities. Um, uh, it's called Allen Telescope Array because it, was, um, re it received a lot of incentives from Paul Allen from Microsoft. Um, and since 2019, the telescope is being upgraded with new generous donations, in particular with from Franklin Antonio that uh, unfortunately passed away last year. Um, so this is the aerial view of the telescope. It is composed by 42 antennas and it's randomly distributed uh, among 250 meters uh, baseline. All the processing is done on site at that uh, green roof building there. Uh, all their servers are there because we can't afford to move the data away because it's terabits per second. Um, and each antenna is connected to that building using a fiber optic. Uh, we, um, each antenna is 42. We have 42 of these, and each one has 20 feet diameter. That's around 6.2 meters. Um, and they are capable to adjust, adjust the elevation as move as, as we want. Um, each antenna here produces around 1.5 band, uh, gigahertz of bandwidth. That's a very large amount for each polarization. So in total, three, three gigahertz per antenna. And currently, we have 20 operational antennas with upgraded feed. And this results in 60 gigahertz of data. And considering each sample has eight bits, this equates to 100, uh, 960 gigabytes per sec, gigabits per second stream. Um, another unique feature of the ETA is the ultra wideband contiguous uh, sensitivity from 900 megahertz to 12 gigahertz. So it's uh, around 11 gigahertz of, of, of bandwidth. So that's uh, one of the unique features of the telescope. Uh, this is uh, all thanks to our new and upgraded feed. It's a log periodic. Um, it, this, was one of the focus of the refurbishment. And the element itself, which looks like a cyberpunk a Christmas tree, is located inside the, the dome of the, 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 uh, each antenna. Um, inside, it's evacuated from, with vacuum uh, and cryocooled to temperatures close to absolute zero. And this is to improve the sensitivity to higher frequencies around millimeter wave. And the equipment is located inside the dome. Um, so the computer cluster is, is made by servers of the shelf supermicro for user chassis with dual AMD EPIC. Um, but actually, most of the processing is done by the GPUs. We have two 3090 classes GPU inside each server and, and a Mellanox 100 gig network cards and two PCIe and VME carrier boards to write the data for a fast and write read and write cache. 
Um, after the conversion from optical back to RF, the signal is now converted again to using LOs and digitized by the RF socket board. This is the RF socket board. This is powered by a Xilinx FPGA that has an integrated ADC, so uh, data handling is better. And the data is digitized and pre-channelized with the FPGA and sent over to the servers with uh, 100 gig links over the network. Um, this is what the data stream will look like when you tap into the, the, the output of the, the, F, the RF sock boards. You can see here over the top there is the is a weather satellite downlink that transmits images. And the bottom there you can see a LTE signal being captured by the telescope. This is downlink 20 megahertz wide, so quite a bit bandwidth there. Um, and since the refurbishment started, we have lots of uh, new science we presented with papers, um, including finding multiple fast radio bursts, and also imaging a bunch of galaxies using our correlator, and measured hundreds of pulsar timings. So these are just examples here. Um, so let's talk about beamforming. So here's a, um, it's, it's it's just enough to understand the applications of blade. So beamforming is a technique used to aggregate the signal received by uh, multiple antennas uh, in a few very, and it also used by, to have a, a few very, no, oh my God, a very useful ways. Uh, so let's suppose you have a bunch of antennas on a single line and a transmitting source over the left, over the left there. So that source is transmitting, and the signal traveling at the speed of light will take more time to reach the one in the right than one in the left. So you need to account for that delay, the time delay. And so that's what, why we use the beam farming. And if you see that equation there, we just use complex numbers received by each antenna ADC, and then multiply the, that number by a delay factor that is a complex phase and then we sum every antenna, and then we have a large antenna pointing to the direction of our source. So that aggregates the power of multiple antennas together. Um, in radio astronomy, there is a very heated debate between these technologies. Uh, on one side, you have a very conservative institutions where they want to do things as they are doing for decades, and and on the other side, there, is a, there are new technologies that matured in the last 10 years, like, uh, like GPUs, and where processing can be done uh, using a more forgivable language than HDL and a lower cost. Um, for the Allen Telescope Array, we used a hybrid approach where we use FPJs uh, for the analog and digital conversion and some very foundational DSP that we don't expect to change. Um, and then we use the, the FPG, the, the GPUs to do the beam former and the rest of processing, uh, which are programmed in CUDA. CUDA is not easy, but for sure it is uh, easier than HDLs like Verilog and VHDL. Um, and this gives us the ability to reprogram and our processing chain uh, from observation to observation, and also deliver functionality that scientists request daily. One, of, one cool of example of this um, we, that we can develop and deploy something at our back end is when the SLS rocket launched a bunch of CubeSats to the moon, and one of those satellites had problems communicating with the ground station. Um, so they shot out an email asking for the community to try to find the, the satellite because they might have diff, uh, different telemetry. They were pointing at one point and then could be that the satellite was in a, at another point. So they asked for help. So we've planned and even started writing uh, some modifications to backend, to the blade backend, uh, which would be possible to check if the signal was being transmitted. We could do a fast raster of over the sky and pinpoint the location. But unfortunately, the sky, the satellite, 
was not on the sky uh, when we were ready to observe it. Um, so this led me to play, uh, to support all these GPU code that we developed in our in-house framework Blade, called Blade. Um, in short, it's called Breakthrough Listen Accelerated DSP Engine. Yeah, I really tried there. Um, and it's completely open source and was written uh, from ground up using C++20 for compressing. Our latest software was written in C, so that's a big jump. Um, and the processing is done in NVIDIA's GPU and programmed using Qt. Uh, currently, it processes an aggregated uh, data stream produced by the twin antennas. And this results in 60 gigahertz data distributed among 16 computer instances made by RTX 3090 and VME uh, AMD Epic and, um, and, uh, and VME cache. And this is around 60 gigabyte, gigabits per second for, for instance. Um, and the processing is done real time. Uh, we currently support eight processing modules. Modules is that uh, unit that implements DSP code, um, like beamforming, channelization, polarization, etc. I will talk more about them in the next slides. And the three main rules while developing the code is the first one being the performance while hackable. Uh, this means that the code should be, shouldn't be over-optimized to a point where it's unreadable or hard to make changes because um, at, at a scientific um, people can't really code very well. So, <laughs> um, so we made it easy. We have stacked away lots of things. Um, now, but this poses a problem. Uh, this thing is deployed in a radial telescope processing terabits of data per second. So it needs to be optimized, but we can't make it hard. Uh, the solution here was to do the best we can to apply the optimizations behind the scenes using abstractions. Um, and the second rule was not to be afraid of using new technologies, but if we, because if we need to fulfill round number one to be easy, we need to take some bets in this department. Uh, so therefore, new technologies. Uh, for low number of dependencies, um, most of the times dependencies help you achieve what you want faster without code. Um, but sometimes they, they talk different languages with each other. So in this case, that means that you, trans you need to transpose your multi-dimensional array every time you use a different library, and that's not very performant. Um, um, so this is the, the techno update of Blade, and I'm very excited to talk about this because Previously, I've done just astronom uh, conferences, presentations at astronomical conferences that they don't care about code. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this is a very, uh, very high-level review of the of the on-site DSP engine. Um, so starting from the left, we have the antennas connected to the, the DSP room, that green roof building, using RF over fiber. Uh, the first processing chain is the analog cluster that will convert that analog fiber to, to RF signals. And that RF signals are being down converted by the local <coughs> oscillators um, and then digitized using our RF SOC boards. Uh, the, the, the digitized signal is then transmitted back to, down to the servers using the 100 gig network. Um, then the data stream is unpacked using the CPU called, uh, with another project called HP Guppy, and then uploaded to the, to the GPU where Blade takes uh, control and do most of the processing of the data. And later, if, the na if it's necessary, Blade will down transfer the data back to the CPU for long-term storage. Um, here, uh, Blade is organized in three different three main classes. The first one is the module. Uh, this is where the CUDA kernels are stored, as well as some verification and instantiation logic necessary for the kernel. Um, you can think this as a pipeline layout from Vulcan. Vulcan. Uh, and the sec one, second one is the pipeline itself, uh, where a group of modules is contained 
and a pipeline is responsible to instantiate its module and extract the configured CUDA kernel for execution. Um, the last component of Blade is Blade Runner, where instances of a pipeline will be instantiated as workers. And this is similar to a work pool where asynchronous jobs um, form the pipelines are run. Um, heterogeneous memory management. Uh, let's start by a foundational element of Blade that is the place we start data from, for processing. And this is a very, a very straightforward problem, uh, but, is, but the more you think about it, get the harder it gets. Uh, with the current solution, something might be misallocated, freely, free, unfree, misused, um, because, mainly because of CUDA, not about because of C++. So we came up with something called Blade Vector, and its, its main focus is to handle the heterogeneous allocation of, uh, of memory allocation, and also fulfill all these requirements here. So the allocation, the allocation interface should be independent of the device, in this case being the CPU and the, C, the GPU. No role pointers, I think we all learned this at some point. Um, yeah, automatic allocation, lifecycle handling, and multi-dimensionality, similar to what MD span uh, implemented in C++ 23. Uh, so first iteration, the idea is to wrap a CUDA pointer inside a stud span uh, here. So span are great. It gives you multiple methods that are very helpful. For example, the size bytes and begin end as child support. And even have multi-dimensionality support using the stud MD span from C++ 23. And all of this while preventing you need uh, you of you being of you using a pointer arithmetic to access data, and here's an example of it. You just use call CUDA CUDA malloc managed, and then you pass the pointer that that was located to the to the span, and then you can use the span as you expect. So right now we have we don't mess we need we don't need to mess with pointer logic, but we can do better. So we can wrap the std span inside a custom class and add that custom constructor and destructor to allocate memory for you when you allocate that very C++-like. And very similar what std vector does with a custom allocation for GPU code. Uh, and then this ensures that dynamic memory life cycles uh, without memory leaks most of the time. Uh, it also abstracts away some lower level CUDA calls that are uh, very, that we learned was very significant uh, for errors. Um, and also it uses the ability to add helpers functions to our data. If you want need a new method here, you can add it. So now we implemented an automatic allocation lifecycle and also the ability to uh, provide custom accessors to your data data type, and that's looking good. But um, the previous allocation, the implementation doesn't verify the memory locality. So this can create problems that wouldn't be verified during compilation. So you could, for example, pass a GPU vector to a function expanding CPU memory, and that would crash very hard. Um, our fix to this is to add a template to the vector class with the memory device location. And um, the device identification is re represented by this num here. So we have CPU, CUDA, metal, Vulcan, whatever. Um, and this leaves less room for errors and verifies the data handoff at compile time. So you don't need to uh, add uh, runtime. Um, checks there, so better performance. Um, so here at the constructor of, of the vector class, we have logics to allocate the memory accordingly using the, the templated uh, value there. And we also have another template a parameter that is the data type. So we can choose the data type using the template, kind of like stud complex um, and other 
numbers. Um, and this is a clean way to choose memory allocation uh, for the memory locality. And most importantly, with a device-independent interface. So you can see here, if you need some GPU memory, just vector CUDA. Same thing for CPU, but you just change the enumeration there, and it will work with, um, with what you want. Um, the copy, so uh, another opportunity here. To copy data between devices, it's necessary to specify the direction um, to the CUDA driver. So this is done by using the CUDA memcopy host to device or device to host flags. And now that we know where the data is and we, we can use an abstraction to copy data without using that flag. So, so there, there's a main function here. So copy vectors and then use templates. And then this is a main function that will take the, 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 the flag there and use the mem copy async. You can notice async here. All the data computation and copies in Blade are asynchronous and um, managed by the pipeline. So we have, we can do some tricks later down the line. And then we have another function that calls the master function. And since we know where the data is, we can use templates. And for example, if you pass CPU, CPU, we can use host to host. CUDA to CPU can host to device, very simple. In the end, you have, you don't need to specify your direction. So that's better. Um, so going great, we got device-dependent code and a CUDA uh, a copy uh, improvement there. But our data often has multiple dimensions because we are here working with multiple antennas, multiple beings, multiple uh, sources. So um, to abstract some logic from the user, we added a new uh, class to the vector called shape. So this is kind of like MD span again, and it, it the class shape will hold uh, hold each dimension depth, um, as well as providing arithmetic to access each element. So, for example, here you have offset, and if you pass um, a, a shape to it, it will return you the position of of your of of the element that you want to access um, in relation to the start of of, of of the contiguous memory. So for example, there you can call offset and the element, and then it will return six where the, where the element is. And then to access, uh, and this can be made better by using the operator overload, overload. So you can pass a shape using the brackets and it would return the actual value. Um, and in C++23, we could eliminate the, uh, make, make, make Cleaner like MD span again. Um, so nice, we now fulfill all our requirements for the memory vector. But we, but I'll, I'll, I also want to talk about a couple of unintended features that was made possible by this uh, architecture that is zero allocation profiling and permutations. So the f first bonus is the profiling. Uh, this is because of very specific need of our case. Our, of our use case, um, because the observation parameters are very dependent uh, on the kind of science we have, and we need a way to predict how much memory we will use for a certain configuration. And sometimes we can't uh, run the observation just as a, as a test because there is another observation being conduced, conduced at the same time. So. Uh, we developed this API that will basically disable the allocation, um, disable the actual allocation of the code, and you can execute your code as is, like here. So you start capture, you execute your, your, all your modules, instantiation, your pipeline initialization. But since the profiling is being conduct, conduct uh, is capturing will be enabled and it will just report how many bytes you are allocating for each device and return. So no data is actually allocated. And then you can see a summary of all the data being allocated and you can predict if that configuration will work uh, with the hardware without even, you can do that without this, but you will need to, to manually write 
all your your initialization routine. So that's mark out. This is the cleanest way we could have made it. Um, so another thing about scientific blasts or or numerical stuff is permutations, transpositions is very uh, ominous on this field. So uh, we have uh, three rules of, of transpositions. First, don't uh, alter your code to to use what we got, what you you have. And if you really, really need to, you can use a view to your data instead of copying, uh, of reading the data, copying to another point. So that's a round trip from DRAM, and that's bad because it's, it's slow. By viewing it, we just access it in a different um, form, and instead of doing uh, star and lows, we just have some pointer arithmetic that is handled by the shape class uh, to do this. That is very cheap on the device, so that comes out almost as free. And if you don't have control over the next step, so you can have views to index the data in a different way, you need to, to uh, perform the transposition. That's why I, I said um, limit the number of dependencies of your code, because if you have dependencies, you can change the view of the data. Um, and as I previous, previously said, uh, the module is where the CUDA kernels lies, and the module provides a standard way to initialize uh, and configure such a kernel. And this is achieved by, by using three structs to find inside a module class. And the first one is a static configuration uh, parameters. Second one is the, is the input with the input buffers and output with the output buffers. Um, and with Blade, we need to support multiple telescopes, and it wouldn't be great experience for the developer if your code that does beam forming that is a very generic operation doesn't work in your telescope because it, the current module was written for another telescope. Um, so these three structs provide a generic way to program your module, and your module can be reused on another telescope. Um, and, and this is coming handy because as we prepare to uh, deploy Blade on the VLA at, in New Mexico, the very large array from the movie Contact, um, and after the module is initialized, it will be ready to emit a CUDA kernel ready for the pipeline. For the, for the pipeline. Um, so this is the configuration struct of the module. Um, it's an arbitrary set of parameters that are required for the, the kernel creation, such as um, enable this uh, thing, enable that thing. Uh, yeah. Uh, it also has a block size that is for CUDA reasons. Um, and the configuration can be read, can't be read after initialization for, for the, so this struct can be read with the get config. It's a nice, addition and every parameter here can change during uh, execution of the pipeline so this is a set and forget you set you configure and then you can modify and need to destroy and then create again uh, to modify something here um, on another note notice the template parameters of the class so these are the input and output types so each module can be used with different types uh, because we are currently using 32-bit uh, floats, but in the future we plan to use half-precision floats because the telescope itself just produces data at 8-bit rate. So it's overkill to use 32-bit. And ideally, 8-bit floats, but that's not supported at pure classes. GPU, and we don't want to buy 16 GPUs. Uh, again, uh, so this is crucial to make the pipeline operating at uh, efficient uh, and peak performance. And smaller data, data types like halves help us compute, help us with faster compute and half memory. We are also very constrained about memory because we have like uh, gigabytes of data for each beam that we create for each source. So we are currently using like 24 meg gigabytes of, of, of data to uh, VRAM to process things, so uh, we are very constrained about memory, not compute. 
Um, now, here's the input and output uh, structs. Notice that each element can be accessed after instantiation by these methods here. The get input buffer, this name can be modified as the user wants. Um, and the in input struct has only constant buffers because the module can't modify the in incoming data. And, and at the moment, at the moment, can it? It is, is uh, it's, it, it's assumed that it's read only data, but in the future, this might change because we want to do some in place kernels because of the memory, uh, memory, uh, memory limitations we have. Um, and although the module creation is generic, large parts of the module backend need to be tailor made for a specific telescope. So therefore, the generic mode module class can be inherited by the by a specialization class. For example, here for the ATA, where some some details can be can be changed uh, in order to support a new telescope. So you can reuse some of the code, but you also can uh, make some uh, adjustments for each telescope. Um, so another. Important aspect of Blade is our approach of setup and forget, uh, which is no dyna dynamic memory allocations after the module is initialized. So that's because dynamic allocations during executions are insanely costly. Um, in special with GPUs, we had a problem with QFFT one time that was ma making a um, CUDA malloc of four bytes every iteration. And our pipeline performance went to 10% what we expected. So no dynamic allocations. You just take time during creation to allocate your, all your, your buffers. You pre-calculate the data that can be calculated. And then we run I, over and over again. And this is particularly important with Blade because some observations can take days to complete. So your setup is like. 10 seconds, and then we, you run for 48 hours straight. So here's a good way to improve things. Um, another thing that saves us a lot of, uh, a lot in respect of flexibility, CPU time, and binary size is the just-in-time compilation of our CUDA kernels. Uh, for this, we use NVIDIA RTC, or Real Runtime Compiler wrapped around uh, GT5 as a C++ library here. And this allows our CUDA kernels to be compiled down to machine instructions in, in runtime. So this is important because most of our, of our kernels use templates to improve performance um, because of that setup thing. So here's an example of the ATA being forming kernel. We have all these templates parameters that are uh, integers or booleans that will uh, be important to define in compilation time because these will dictate how many registers, how many shared memory you use for each each module. So we use the just-in-time flexibility to do that um, during execution, and you can access the whole kernel with the QR code, and it's quite large. Uh, uh, and without it, we would have much larger binaries because we would need to create a new kernel compilation for each parameter, and we wouldn't be able to satisfy all the possible configurations without the compilation. Um, so this is the Bing Farmer module. Uh, all the, the, the parameters that is uh, configured, like the frame date and time, antenna coordinates, uh, Bing coordinates, phase center, calibration, complex weights, and observation frequency. So these all are very specific data uh, uh, required by the block, and then it is it runs the that the process that I described earlier. And this is another one that is very interesting. That is high spectrum resolution spectrogram. So most of the time, people are using FFTs to do. Uh, super resolution in games, so that will be 4K, uh, 2,000 lines over 4,000. 
this one, we do 1.5 million bins FFT every second. And that is around 3 million bins uh, every second uh, with, with the ATA. So that's a very large um, data stream, and we use QFFG for this. And I don't have time to talk about other ones, but uh, we have Correlator, Guppy, and many more. Uh, the pipeline itself is composed by collection of modules. It's also, it's mainly provides synchronization models, mo uh, methods for the runner, and also holds host device staging buffers. Uh, here we can see interface uh, we, with the interface with like compute where the runner will call this function and all the compute will be done and synch synchronized to have a blocking call to synchronize the module. If, and if you don't want to do that, there is, is synchronized that will return if it's synchronized or not. Every pipeline will create a new CUDA uh, stream. So everything can, multiple streams can be run, multiple pipelines can be run in uh, concurrently, asynchronously. Um, this is an example of initialization of the pipeline. So, very simple, we start locating some initial buffer memory uh, containing the input of the first block. Then, uh, then we declare the first block, in this case a casting module, because the, the telescope produces 8 bits, we use 32 bits, so we need to cast that. Later, we access the output of the first cast module with the getters that I talked previously, and then connect the second module to the pipeline and so on. Behind the scenes, the pipeline will, uh, will initialize its module immediately, so you can use connect the, the other one using the previous as a dependency. Um, this is the data that is transferred uh, in and out of the module. This is the, the method that does that. Uh, the runner will call it when it's time, so when you, your CPU sends you data, it will call this function and it's uh, expecting CPU memory, and then we'll copy asynchronously called the copies to, co to copy the data from CPU to GPU. And another important optimization of Blade, here's the usage of CUDA graphs. Uh, the CUDA kernel inside each module is registered uh, with CUDA graph during execution, and this results in lower CPU usage and also it's um, a little bit faster on the GPU compute. Uh, this is one of the abstracted uh, optimizations that we use that the developer doesn't even need to know what happened because it's completely transparent. So when you connect the module, it will register. And then when you execute the pipeline, it will start by streaming, ca capturing the, the, the CUDA calls, and then it will, it will call all the, the processing uh, CUDA kernels uh, with a for loop, and then it will end the capture, save that, that graph, and then instead of calling each uh, module to process, you just call a single time the CUDA graph that you just registered. So that, that makes things uh, significantly faster. PyTorch made uh, addition two years ago with this one, and you cur your code can be faster. Um, so let's talk about concurrent execution now. Uh, we have pipelines that represent a bunch of modules, and we know that every operation inside a pipeline is asynchronous. Um, now we need a way to execute them in a parallel and track their status. Um, to do that, we created Blade Runner, a class that provides a synchronous execution queue for pipelines. And this is also support multiple instances of a pipeline to be executed at the same time. And the operation of the runner is similar to a worker pool. So you have threads and you execute their code. The methods inside the runner class is pretty much what you would expect from a queue. And here is the constructor of, of, of the runner and all, all the methods, so very simple. Uh, if you want to check the complete class, you can use the care code there. Um, before we get further into the runner, let's talk about the whole asynchronous architecture of blading is important. Uh, this slide represents the execution time of, of each kernel, of each CUDA graph. 
Uh, the first row is what happens when you use a single worker inside a runner. So you are wasting 50% of your compute, 50% of your data throughput, because both, both compute and transfers are dependent of each other and they can't run in, 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 in parallel. So what we do is to instantiate two workers for each runner, and then when one job is transferring, the other job is computing, and so on. So you can chain that, that thing and then use almost 100% of your compute, 100% of your, uh, of your uh, PCI transfer speed. And we are pretty much bottlenecked at the moment by PCI 4 transfer speed, so that's around 30, 30 gigabytes per second. So we can't get data to the GPU as fast as we want, and that is limiting our compute uh, using uh, <coughs> PCI is limiting in this case. Uh, this is the example of a production pipeline of the Bing Farmer. Uh, it's not; it's a very simple one. If you want a very not simple one, use the advanced example there. Um, that that chains together two pipelines, and when one pipeline is ready, after 64 iterations, it calls another pipeline to process the 64 previous iterations of the other pipeline. Uh, it's complicated, uh, and this is, might be a little bit too low level for astronomers. Uh, so uh, a more high level might might come in the future. Um, uh, this is two of the production pipelines that we use. We have mode B that does the bean farming and the mode H that does the high spectral resolution uh, thing. So we have cast, channelization, bean farming, circular polarization, detector module, and then cast again. We can input for the CPU and output for the CPU, or we can input from CPU and chain together the mode H that will do the, the FFT with, with a chained pipeline there. And it's good that way because you don't need to go to your CPU and then back to the GPU with 24 gigabytes of transfer time over PCIe. If you chain together, you have 900 gigabytes of, of transfer. So that's better. Uh, you, use, you transfer the output of this one to the that one, and then you run again. You can do that definitely as many pipelines that, that you want. Um, this is why Minding your server is important because uh, at Blade 6.5, we had two programs that did one thing. So Blade did the Bing farming and raw spec did the, the, the GPU high spectral resolution. So that, would, that means that you need to save the data back to, the, to, to NVMe and then read it back and then do the calculation and, read and write. So that will account for 3.6 gigabytes of writes, 3.2 gigabytes of reads. And now that we support high spectral resolution in Blade, we just copy one pointer in the GPU memory to another pipeline, and then we eliminate most of the reads. And we just uh, write the, the final product to the, to the MVME. And considering that MVME's lifespans are not unlimited, this uh, is, uh, uh, this works. And another thing is that we can uh, integrate the output of the high spectrum resolution uh, pipeline over in the GPU and run that indefinitely. And uh, with another case, without, we, we, if you want to integrate, you need to save all your observation data that will be half a petabyte uh, over a day or two, and then you need to process. So instead of doing that, you just do Real time, you have your very low write speeds and you don't need to save petabytes of data. Um, so this is 0 0.7. We have a much more uh, efficient. And later, we are working to eliminate the CPU unpacking of the streaming data from the RF sock boards and run that over RDMA or something um, and make that more efficient as possible without hopping to the CPU to processing the GPU. Uh, so the main takeaways is mind your target audience. You can make some very cool things, but if the people who will use it won't understand it, that won't be much useful. And sometimes the optimization is not obvious. Uh, you can say, oh, I can change this CUDA kernel will be much faster. And then you hit PCI speeds. 
uh, limitations. No transpositions, use fields. To then try to hide your optimizations behind abstractions. And also, more importantly, our telescope array is open for visitor most of the time. Just check it. If you're passing by Northern California, come check us. There is Bernie Falls next to us, and, and also the Lassen Peak. That's very interesting national park. So, and you can contact me. I can give you a tour, maybe, uh, depending on my schedule. Uh, and thanks for listening. If you have comments or questions, I can be contacted there or after this. Um, of the, uh, over the break, uh, I will be uh, uh, happy to answer. Uh, thank you. Uh, any questions now? If yep. Um, so on the last thing, you said the next step will be trying to skip the CPU transfer. Yep. Like what, how will you do that? Um, yeah, we have multiple ideas. We can use like FPGA uh, special cars to do some uh, Rocky or Infinity Band transfers over the network. But these cars are not very um, available and they are also expensive. So we are thinking about copying, having a uh, a computer with FPGA connected to the PCIe 4 and then another GPU and then the FPGA will DMA over the data to the GPU. The GPU will do the processing that we want and then send over a PCIe uh, Mellanox card to the, to the server. So that, that way we can uh, target each package to each instance uh, and distribute the data as evenly as possible, more efficiently as possible. Our uh, uh, our limitation would be the throughput of the switch in this situation. Sorry? Uh, what the reason for not putting the dimensions uh, for the vectors into the template? Um, because then you could yeah. pre calculate some offsets already, um, or will they go away when you switch to every span? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we, we thought about that, but Sometimes you need to to use two different um, two different uh, sh dimensions shapes, and then you need to to account for two type two different types, and then check that. It it, it it's a good uh, yeah. We didn't have time for that, but certainly very interesting. Okay, yeah. and yeah. just another remark: your memory allocation. I think currently you have UV. Um, when you allocate your flows from CUDA, uh -huh. um, so you should probably uh, check the lifetime uh, things in C++ uh, 23. I have what, sorry? Uh, you have currently, when you uh, allocate your, your flows on, uh, on CUDA uh -huh. uh, and, and work with this memory, um, okay. the objects are not created in in the in the abstract machine of C++, so oh, yeah. you have to tell C++ that they are really oh, yeah. they are flows. Oh yeah, <laughs> sounds good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is like <laughs> this is not actual f f uh, code because it's like ah, okay. <laughs> this is more like please understand what I'm talking about, <laughs> not the actual code. <laughs> yeah, most of it is, but no. okay. it's some yeah. details, but yeah. What, actually, do I have a question on that? So how how do you do that? I guess I've never seen that in CUDA programming. And no, you, you could do it. Uh, so in, if you use like like mem copy or things uh, in C plus plus twenty three, you will get the objects created for you or the lifetime. Right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Or you can just do placement new. Placement. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In, that in case, this case, yeah. that's probably the right answer. Or you can use this uh, um, as. Uh, oh, Oh, right, 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 right. You're not reinterpreting existing memory. Yeah, right, right. You can do split memory, right? Yeah, right. C plus plus twenty three is our in our roadmap. Let's see when we can update the GCC in the machines. Cool. Right. All right. Thank you, everyone.